So let, let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this time today. I thank you for the opportunity to serve you. I ask you, Lord, to have your will and your way in us. Lord, I, I ask that you take this time that we have together and use this, that your glory might be manifested to others and that we might see and come to understand um, more perfectly what it is you would have us know. And then, Father, make us good stewards of that information, that we might be uh, your servants and in your hands and doing things according to your will in our lives. Uh, make us the representatives of Christ that we ought to be, I pray, in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so uh, let's get let's get into this. We we're we're studying apologetics. Our uh, our classes uh, so far have carried us through a number of different things here. Today we're looking at primarily two different elements of apologetics. The the first is that that Jesus is exactly who he said he is scripturally. Now I've heard I've heard. Uh, those who argue against the faith argue that Christ never claimed to be God. We're going to we're going to rule that out today. That He never claimed to be deity. We're going to rule that out today, and we're going to show you scripturally exactly where He declared Himself to be God, and exactly how we are to defend that with with others. So that's that's the first thing we will do. There's actually. Uh, what we'll see here is that there are a number of things that Geisler has taken us through, the 12 points that show Christianity is true. The next three we're going to cover today, and he puts them in the order of the, the New Testament is historically reliable. I'm actually going to put that on the back end today. I'm going to take the, the next two. The New Testament says Jesus claimed to be God, and Jesus claimed to be God was miraculously confirmed. I'm going to take those two and put them on the front end and then hit the New Testament historically reliability on the back end. Now, when we did, <clears throat> excuse me, when we did systematic theology, I think all of you guys were with us at that point. When we did systematic theology, I touched on the, the New Testament historical reliability. And I said that we would come back to that when we got to apologetics. And that is where we are today. This is perhaps one of the most important apologetic items that we'll cover in terms of defending the faith, because if we have someone who does not believe, uh, who is not a Christian, who does not believe Jesus is Messiah, who does not give any credibility to the Bible, one of the first things we have to do is, is to defend the reliability of the text. If we can't do that, there's no use to present any text at all from the scriptures because if they don't give reliability to scriptures, what's good is it to show that the scriptures say anything? So if we can, but if we can show the historic reliability of the scriptures, then, uh, then we have that to, to uh, give as evidence for everything else. If we can't show the scriptures are true, and that they have credibility, then we have no basis for defending our faith outside of uh, the, uh, the secular world, which we're going to go back and show today. There are many, many things within the secular world that, that show the text are true, and that has to be the way we approach this. We have to take the things that are, uh, that are material, natural, and secular, uh, i.e. things like um, uh, the, the, all the archaeological evidence, the scientific things we talked about last time. We have to take those things and show that the Bible affirms those things long before uh, they, that the, anybody in, in those times could have ever uh, made a case for them. For instance, somebody asked me in the last couple of weeks, well, doesn't, uh, doesn't the Bible claim that the, the earth is flat? And I said, well, where did you get that? Where, where did you get the, the, you know, the idea that the Bible claims the earth is flat, that we're flat earthers? And, uh, well, I don't know. 
<clears throat> well, the fact is that that the Bible presents the earth as uh, the, the easiest and best translation would be an orbis or uh, something that is not just circular, but like an orb, something that is that is not just two dimensional, but is three dimensional in its in its uh, features. So the word orbis is used. And so I had to be able to go back and defend, hey, the scriptures talk about that when people thought that the earth was flat. So the, the text was, def, was presenting something that the, that the culture and the times did not even present as being true. It presented it ahead of its time. And that's the kind of thing we've got to be able to do is take those uh, material, natural, secular kinds of scientific evidences and point to them. But I also want to be able to point back to the fact that they point to the reliability of scriptures so that we can then go back and use the scriptures to, to make case for other things. Okay. Does, does that kind of all fit for everybody? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah amen. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's the purpose of this. And, uh, mm -hmm. I've got internet connection it's going in and out. So if you, if you lose me, just hang on, I'll come back to you. Okay. All right. So this is, this is where we're going to go today. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take these, these uh, two elements right here. The new Testament says Jesus claimed to be God and the, the miracles confirm that Jesus is exactly who he said he is. Uh, I.e., that he fulfills the many prophecies of the old Testament uh, that he, he lived a sinless and miraculous life. In other words, he did actual miracles. And that his uh, prediction and accomplishment of his resurrection was actually accomplished. And that the, the history of the times point to that outside of scripture. So that's, that's kind of where we're going. So what is the purpose of prophecy? Prophecy does... Uh, and these are my elements here, but, but I think this kind of breaks it down as to what we, how we need to view prophecy. Uh, the purpose of fulfilled prophecy is to affirm the teaching is true. That if prophecies are fulfilled, if prophecies are made in, in time, fulfilled in, in, in the future, exactly as they were said to be, uh, said to be in, in prophecy, uh, and not just general things. We're not talking about Nostradamus <laughs> kinds of prophecies, but, but very specific things uh, and specific things that could not be controlled, i.e. Jesus being born in Bethlehem. Jesus would have a hard time uh, conspiring to have himself born in Bethlehem. Does that make sense? <laughs> so we we need to yes we we need to be able to take those pro kinds of prophecies that could not be manipulated in any way shape or form and point to those as affirming the teaching that would be coming. Uh, the second thing is to confirm the persons or the apostles that uh, the purpose of prophecy was to confirm the persons or apostles, and this is. This is really the purpose of them doing miracles as well. And the prophecies point to the teachers being able to do these kinds of activities, these kinds of miracles. Number three, to attest to the message that the message that are being given by the prophets is actually from God. So if you have a, if you have a prophecy given and a prophecy fulfilled, that's not something that would naturally happen if those prophecies are specific. That's not something that, that you would say, okay, Isaiah said this 700 years before, or Ezekiel said this 700 years before, and Christ came in and fulfilled that perfectly. Or things like Isaiah pointed to uh, crucifixion 700 years or 600 years before there was any crucifixions on earth. He pointed to the fact that the Messiah would be crucified and that he would be pierced for his transgressions long before crucifixion or piercing of any kind like that 
would be would be used by the culture. So that that's another reason that the uh, that these things are done. And then the lastly, to affirm, confirm, and attest to the authenticity of the one Messiah. That the mm-hmm. fact that over three hundred prophecies are made. And only one person in history has actually ever fulfilled every single one of those prophecies in real time. And that was the person of Jesus Christ. So he affirmed, confirmed, and attest to the authenticity of the one true Messiah, uh, Jesus Christ. So those are, those are the things we want to point to as we go through this today. Now some notes from, from Geisler as we move forward and some of my comments on them. So this is, this is pointing t- from prophecy. Old Testament claims uh, for Jesus's deity. Old Testament claims for his deity. In Psalm 2, uh, verse 7, the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Now, Psalm is obviously written long before Jesus' time. And the word Lord there is the word Yahweh. It is pointing to Jehovah God and says to me, uh, this is a prophecy concerning something that, that would be true of Christ. You are my son. Prophecy often speaks in the first person. So you hear these words and you think, well, who is the me there? Well, the prophet is speaking as if he were Messiah at this point. And he points to Jesus, the Messiah, actually being the son of God, which would point to his deity. So understand what's taking place here in the culture, in his history, uh, in the Hebraic way of thinking, the son was, had the same credentials as the father. So in other words, the father gives the son his authority, gives the son his name, if you will. So that was Hebraic thought. And that was, speaking to a Hebraic mindset, the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, said to me, the one who is being prophesied about, you are my son. Uh, Psalm 45, your throne, O God, and, and Geisler made a big deal of this one, and I think rightly so. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Therefore, God, even your God, has anointed you. He has God anointing God. So what is he saying? The one being anointed is equally deity with the one who is doing the anointing. So he has Yahweh, Father God, anointing the Son, who is God. And so we have this rather awkward language in the psalm that really, until the prophecy is fulfilled, is hard to understand. And it's only in retrospect, looking back at it, that we can really begin to go, wow, that, that, that prophecy genuinely is a wow. prophecy of the coming of Messiah. Uh, it is God anointing God. Yeah. Uh, Psalm 110, the Lord, Yahweh, again, Jehovah, Yahweh, uh, Jehovah God, Yahweh, said to my Lord, who, who, which is also Yahweh, Uh, sit at my right hand, or excuse me, Adonai, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So you got Yahweh anointing uh, Adonai, both considered God. uh, And he says, then that anointing will be the, uh, the, the ordination, if you will, or commissioning, if you will, of having the authority that once he has that authority, ultimately in the end, all your enemies will set at your feet. So these are the kinds of prophecies that we're talking about pointing to the coming of Messiah. Zechariah, again, 700 years before Christ, uh, the angel of the Lord, Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, uh, answered and said, O Lord of hosts, Uh, And again, this is the word Yahweh or Jehovah. And then in Zechariah 12, and I, the Lord, will pour on the house of David. Now, here's, here's an interesting prophecy because it's pointing to this 
messianic line, uh, this, this uh, heritage that goes back to the throne of David. You know, David was promised that the, the, that the Messiah would come out of his line. Here's Zechariah saying, and the Lord will pour on the house of David the spirit of grace, and then they will look on me, the Lord. Again, this is prophecy written in the first person, whom they have pierced. Here's that word, pierced again out of nowhere. This, this would have been a prophecy that would have made no sense in the context of the cross in the time in which it was written. So here's 700 years, about 680 years before, before crucifixion is ever invented by the Romans, pointing to the piercing of the Lord. And then right immediately after that, it says, and they will mourn for him, inferring that the piercing is going to be his death. And the ones mourn for his only son, and here's that relationship, the son and the father, again. Uh, all the nations, Zechariah 14, uh, all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacle. So this is, this is prophesying that the coming of Messiah will end in this continual worship year after year after year that will take place on the part of the Jews that will ultimately, the very worship that they're doing, the acts that they're doing, will be fulfilled in the coming of Christ. You've, you've heard that Christ did not replace the law. He fulfilled the law. He also fulfilled the worship keeping uh, he fulfilled all the purposes of the worship keeping that they were doing, which were pointing to the coming of Messiah. In other words, the very rituals they were doing were pointing to the coming of the one who was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So here again is prophecy Amen. pointing to these things. Now, secondly, Jesus claims uh, for his deity, go back to the Old Testament. So we look both at the Old Testament uh, of, of uh, Exodus 3.14, where he claimed to be the I am. He's pointing back to Exodus. And he says, uh, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, John 8.58. And then to the scribes, he, he says, he forgave sins. This is something that, that nobody would claim because only God had the right to forgive sins. So when Jesus says, I, I forgive your sins, he indeed is claiming to be God. He's claiming to be Jehovah Jireh, God, uh, the, the, the equivalent of that, his deity. And so when the scribes say, you, you, for, you say you forgive sins, only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says, uh, who can forgive sins but God alone? Mark 2, 5 to 7. So he is, there, he is saying in himself, I, I am forgiving sins. And he's saying to those who are listening, only God can forgive sins. So when somebody says Jesus never claimed to be God, here are two quotes from John 8 and from Mark 2 that clearly show that Jesus is definitely and definitively claiming to be God. Uh, he claimed he should be honored and, in other words, worshipped just as the Father is honored. Uh, he said, should all honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. So he is, he is actually saying the, the honor belongs to himself, the same as it belongs to the Father, not, not somewhat like the honor that's due to the Father, but the same honor is due to the Son as is due to the Father, and then he claims to be the very Son. So what's the significance of all of this? Jesus claiming to be the I Am, 
Well, he is saying that he is the mm -hmm. one who the Old Testament pointed to as the I am. Uh, the significance for the Jew is, is huge. When he says, uh, I am, he is saying he is God. He is deity. And so the significance is to the Jew, he's claiming to be God. Uh, the significance for uh, Jesus saying that he forgives sins. Well, we just covered that. If, if only God can forgive sins. So if Jesus is claiming to forgive sins, he is claiming to be deity. He is claiming to be God himself. And then lastly, Jesus saying that he should be honored or worshiped just as the Father is honored. He is saying, uh, I am due the same uh, respect the same honor, the same worship as the Father. He is claiming deity in that as well. So he said he was the Jewish Messiah who is God. And we can look back at these prophecies. And I'm just going to point you in the direction of these prophecies. I do want you to go back and look these up and take them in because these are the very things you need to be able to go back to to point to somebody who says that Jesus never claimed to be God or that prophecies never pointing to him being who he said he was. So both of those things are true. Isaiah 9, 6 and 45, 6, Psalm 110, 1, Zechariah 12, 10, and, and several others we've already made reference to. So this is the woman at the well. Uh, the woman at the well, uh, Jesus, you remember, he, he goes... Uh, to this place that he says, I must needs go there. Uh, nobody wanted to go to this place that was a Jew because there were these people there who were mixed breed, who were worshiping another God mm -hmm. on Mount Gerizim. And so he goes to this woman who is, uh, who's had many husbands and who is a prostitute and nobody will be seen with her at the well. And he goes to her at the very time nobody else is at the well. And that's the reason she goes that time of day. And she says to this to Jesus, she says, I know that Messiah is coming. Now you can go back and read the rest of this text, but, but the end of this is that Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. Very clear, very direct. There, there can be no mistake in John 4, 25 and 26 of what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that he is the Messiah that he is the one who has been pointed to for centuries that, that would come. The high priest said, are you Amen. the Christ Messiah, the son of the blessed? Now this was an attempt to trap Jesus. And Jesus said, well, he could have said about anything right here, but he says, I am. Yeah. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power coming with the clouds of heaven the high priest said, what further need do we have of witness? You have heard this blasphemy. So Jesus, in the mm -hmm. face of the high priest, in the face of his, his judgment, uh, claims to be God. He is Messiah. And then five, uh, he accepted worship on 10 different occasions, which was due only to God. When Jesus accepts worship, he is saying, I am God. I am deity. No man, no Jew for sure would ever accept worship. And on 10 different occasions, he does that. And here I'm going to point to these 10 quickly, but you can make note of these. Uh, they're also in Geisler's notes. Uh, the mother of James and John in, in Matthew 20, 20, he, he says he accepts worship. Uh, the Gerizim demoniac, uh, he accepts worship. The healing of the blind man, uh, he accepts worship. Uh, doubting Thomas, he accepts worship from Thomas. Uh, the women at the tomb, he accepts worship from them. The Canaanite woman accepts worship from her. His disciples, after this great storm, he accepts worship. The, the healing of the leper and the leper coming back, he accepts worship then. Uh, the rich young ruler, he accepts worship. And disciples at the Great Commission, you remember just before his ascension, he accepts worship of his disciples at that point. 
So it's pretty clear that Jesus accepts worship. And the only question is, is this a claim to be deity? Well, if you look, if you know anything about Jewish history or Hebraic thought, you know that no man would ever claim this. And, and we know that even angels told men not to kneel down or bow to them uh, because to accept worship would be to, to claim to deity itself. Paul refused worship. Uh, so we don't, we don't, we don't, have any doubt about what is being said here when on 10 different occasions, Jesus accepts worship from humans. Mm. So his claim to deity, number one, the Bible forbids worshiping anyone but God, Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Humans refuse worship. See it in, all the way through Acts, but Acts 14 particularly. Angels also refuse worship. Jesus accepts worship on these 10 occasions we've already looked at. And Jesus never rebuked anyone who worshiped him. We see other people rebuked for trying to worship others, but we never see Jesus rebuke anyone for trying to worship him. And uh, I'll point you back, uh, even as we're looking at all the, the current events of today that I've pointed to already, uh, Go back and listen to some of my messages from, from our Revelation study over the last two and a half years. And it points to a whole lot of what's going on today. And in, in Jesus in Revelation 22 accepts worship at this, this new, new prophesied time that is to come. And, and believe me, there is coming a time when every knee will bow uh, in, in Revelation 22. He even commended some for worshiping him and acknowledging his deity in John 20 and Matthew 16. And therefore, by accepting worship, Jesus is indeed claiming to be God. I asked several times as we go through this particular uh, set of slides, what is the significance? Because I think part of the downfall of maybe listening to some of the Geisler videos without any thought of any of this is not to think of what the significance is for what he is teaching and saying. What is the significance of six, seven, and eight? He put his words on the level with God's words. Jesus put his words on the exact same level as God's words. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And that he rejects me does not receive my words, has that which judges him, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. He is saying his very words are going to be the judgment of those. Whatever you ask in my name, uh, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray in his name. I mean, just think on that for a moment, to pray in his name. Like Geisler uh, I think it was Geisler that I was listening to on these, these videos, and maybe it was another teacher on this, this text, said, well, can you imagine going to church and having some preacher stand up and preach a message and then say to you, now, if you want your prayers to be affected, just pray in my name. That would be a pretty bold claim. Mm. And that's what Jesus does here. He says, pray in my name. That's what he's teaching those who are following him. Uh, number eight. Some preachers do that. Yeah, they do, and, and are doing that even as we speak. Yeah. Uh, he, he accepted the titles of deity. And when I say this, I'm, I'm saying he, he accepted titles that can only be given to God. When, when he comes up and meets up with Doubting Thomas in the upper room after the resurrection, uh, you know, he told Thomas, stick your finger in my hand, stick your finger, hand in my side. Uh, and and he, then Thomas, doubting Thomas, responds to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus blessed Amen. him. So Thomas is claiming his deity even as he worships Jesus. And Jesus accepts that titles, those titles that can only be given to God himself. Uh, Peter answering him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So Simon 
Peter mm -hmm. is saying to him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So what are the other claims uh, here to deity? Let me see if I can move this just a bit. Can you guys still see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good enough. All right, so the other claims to his deity. Um, God himself gives claims to, to Jesus' deity. He says, this is my beloved son. Uh, you'll remember at the baptism of Jesus, God speaks from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Uh, angels claim the deity of Christ. He will be great, will be called the son of the highest. That's deity. The, the holy one who is born will be called the son of God. That's the claim to his deity. And, and these are Luke 1. This is right before the birth of Christ in Luke chapter 2. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, this is Luke 2, the David, the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This is the angels proclaiming to the shepherds in the fields. So you got God claiming Jesus' deity. you got the angels claiming de Jesus' deity. You even have demons claiming Jesus' deity. What have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come to torment us before our time? In other words, we know you have authority to do this. We know you have the power to do this. And they call him the son of God. Yes, demons recognize and understand who Jesus is. Make no mistake about it. Satan knows who Jesus is beyond any shadow of a doubt. And then Thomas, as we've already said, my Lord and my God. The writer of Hebrews, who we don't know exactly who the writer of Hebrews is, could be Paul. He, he, there are some. I do. Oh. <laughs> there, <laughs> there are some hints. Okay, Pastor. <laughs> uh, Christ being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person. So uh, let me go back and take some of this language apart here. The, the words expressed image right here. This is the, these are the words right here we get the word facsimile from. It is the exact image of the original. The brightness of his glory, the image, the exact image or expressed image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, for to which the angel did and he ever say, you are my son. Uh, and when... Whenever you see, by the way, um, the words angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, this is what we call a theophany. Now, what is a theophany? Father God. What's a, what's a theophany in the Old Testament? Or a Christ, uh, Christophany? Christophany. The study of Christ. It's, uh, every time it says uh, angel of the Lord, it right. says Christ. It's a direction of Christ. Okay, so theophany or a Christophany in the Old Testament, every time you see the word angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, this is actually the pre-incarnate Jesus speaking. Mm. So when we see those in the Old Testament, and this, makes, this gives us an idea, New Testament, but gives us an idea of this. Uh, and, and then it says, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So there's worship going to this one. And then, but to the son, he says, this is Father God, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Uh, so the proclamation of the one who is the coming Messiah says that he will be the king of kings and Lord of lords. So here's the objection. Uh, the objection from the unbeliever or the skeptic or the critic uh, and I, I would commend to you a couple of books that are written called When Skeptics Ask and When Critics Ask. These are two books written in co-authorship with Geisler, When Skeptics Ask and When Critics Ask. Two different things, but these are objections brought by skeptics and critics. So the skeptic or the critic uh, both bring this particular argument, say he can't be both God and at the same time man. This is contradictory. Well, it sounds like a great objection, 
And it, but you have to go back to our systematic theology course, which is one of the reasons we taught systematic theology before I'm bringing you apologetics. Go back to our systematic theology course, and we're going to give our response from that course. He is God and man at the same time, but not in the same sense. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, uh, Geisler uses this as well, and, and a lot of people use this. Josh McDowell uh, uses this argument a lot. Uh, C.S. Lewis used this argument. Uh, one can be a father and a husband at the same time, but not in the same sense. I'm not a husband to my daughter, and I'm not a father to my wife. I'm a father and a husband at the same time, but not in the same sense. It's not in the same relationship. Does everybody get that? Yeah. yeah. So he's yeah. both God and man. And he has those natural, uh, the essence of who he is is both God and man. The essence of who I am is both father and husband, but not in the same sense. His relationship as a man to us is different than his relationship to God to us but he must be both to fulfill the messianic prophecies. And that's the part Amen. that the Jews and particularly those that were, um, those that were the Essenes that were, that camped on the boundaries of Jerusalem and they've dug up where they dug up the, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls was where the Essenes were camped out in, in these times, the Essenes camped out, uh, and uh, after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, uh, they believed that the Messiah was coming in two persons. One would be God and one would be man, and that there would be two messiahs. Oh. But the, the, the reality mm -hmm. was that, that they could not comprehend at the time was that both God and man would come in one person, the person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus has both divine nature and a human nature. And again, I just I carry you back to all that we studied in systematic theology uh, with the triangle and, and all that we studied concerning the Trinity uh, and all that we studied concerning Christology during that time. We did a whole study in Christology and systematic theology. And so I just I, I give you reference back to that that that's the objection and that's the objection answered this is one of the most common objections which is why i picked this one out from several that geisler talked about and and many that guys like uh josh mcdowell talk about and c.s lewis talk about now the the argument of and why, also also yeah. pastor he 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 had to be man in order to identify it with us, and he had to be God in order to save us. Exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. and that's that's the point that we that we did make in systematic theology. He had, I mean, if you think about it, what the Essenes believed made sense to the Hebrew mindset because they didn't believe God could ever be put on the cross. So you had to have two messiahs. You had to be one that would go to the cross, and certainly the one that was God could never go to the cross. You had to have God who was perfect, and you had to have man who, would, who was less than perfect because the less than perfect had to go to the cross. Only the perfect could be God, and he could not go to the cross. So that was their, that was their mindset. But we talked about all of this in, in systematic theology so that we would understand that he had to be both in one in order to fulfill all that Pastor Tom's talking about. He had to, he had to be... Go ahead, Michael. I'm saying where they're right because isn't it ever saying how you know we you can put God on how could you make put God to do anything? You couldn't. Nobody put God on the cross. God put himself on the cross. Exactly. And that yeah. and if we don't understand that, yep. exactly right. Right. if we don't understand yeah. that, we don't get it. Jesus said I have the power to to lay down my life. I have the power to lay down my life, and I have the power to raise it up again. Yeah, exactly. Amen. So here was, let me give you the broad claim that C.S. Lewis made, and then we can go back and read this 
and it'll make a little more sense to you. C.S. Lewis later in Mere Christianity, and if you've not read that, you should. Uh, Mere Christianity said Jesus was either a liar. He said he was the son of God. He, and and he, he said it knowing that he was lying or he was a lunatic. He said it because he was out of his mind. He was crazy. Or in fact, he was both God and man and he was indeed Lord. So he was either a liar or he was a lunatic or he was indeed Lord. So that's the choices we've got. What other choices do we have? Now, let me, let me go back and take that apart just a little bit because some have claimed, well, I don't believe Jesus is Messiah. I don't believe he's God. I don't believe he's the son of God. I, I believe he was a great teacher. I believe he was a great man, but I just don't believe that he was God. Well, if he was a great teacher and a great man, he taught that he was God. We just talked about that. That means that he couldn't be a great man. He couldn't be a great teacher because he's not teaching the truth. So he, he was indeed, as, as C.S. Lewis said, he was a liar, which precludes him being a great man or a great teacher. So he was either a liar or he was a lunatic or indeed he was Lord. And if he was Lord, then we need to give him homage for all that, that he claimed to be. So here's the quote by Lewis. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying a really foolish things of, that people often say about Jesus. I am ready to accept, this is one of those foolish things, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Well, those are contradictory. You can't accept him as a great moral teacher and then say he's not God because he claimed to be God. Do we get that? Yeah. Yeah. That is the one thing we must not say. Why did he accept yeah. Jesus. Uh, a man who's, who's, who, who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would rather be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg <laughs> or else he would be the devil <laughs> of hell. Uh, you, you, one thing you can say about C.S. Lewis, he had a way with words. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, the second part of this is the, is the New Testament historically reliable? In other words, the reason I wanted to reverse these is because the, the, whole, the whole thing concerning Jesus's claims are only good, are only credible if the, if the rest of the New Testament is historically reliable. So in other words, if we can point to things in the New Testament, that are not historically correct, then we're pointing to, to a reason not to believe any of the rest of it. But if we can point to the historical reliability of the New Testament, <clears throat> now remember those words, historic reliability of the New Testament, then we can say, well, if those things are true, then it's very credible to believe that the rest of it is true. Do we understand that? But, it, but if we if we can point to things that are that are obviously untrue, then we have to question the rest of it. So it is important. It the, Go ahead. It goes back to the original thing we were talking about when we first started this. If A equals C and then B equals C, you know, if A equals B and B equals C, then A must equal C. Yep, it's the same. You can make, a, you can put it, definitely make a syllogism out of that. No doubt about it. So we're, we're, we're always going to be attacked if anything in the New Testament can be shown to be false. Now, we know this because historically we have seen the evidence of this being true. We have seen atheists and agnostics and, and even those who are just skeptics question things of the, concerning the reliability of the New Testament. For instance, the New Testament points to a whole group uh, of people from the Old Testament called the Hittites. And for centuries, there was no evidence of any civilization called the Hittites existing. Mm. Well, all the critics came back and said, well, right there it is. You know, there, there's no evidence this so-called civilization of the Hittites existed. If, if there was, we would have found it by now. We would know 
beyond any shadow of a doubt that this or this uh, civilization existed because there's so much talk in the Old and New Testament about this group of people. If they were real, if they were true, uh, that, the, that they actually existed, they would show up. Well, lo and behold, archaeology goes on and we dig up a whole layer within the archaeological record right there close to Jerusalem of an entire civilization with, with uh, scribes on stones uh, in, in, uh, in Hebrew talking about the Hittites <laughs> and, and, and detailed accounts of their history. So archaeology has been our friend through all of this. Now, we use the same kind of arguments against Mormons, for example. Uh, and I know Michael will appreciate this, uh, that when they talk about uh, the Lamanites, uh, we, we point to that and go, show me anything in the historical record that, that this civilization ever existed. Well, we, we don't see anything for... Uh, any of those groups of people that are mentioned in the Book of Mormon for their actual, actually existing in the historical record. And given where he said they existed in the historical record, they definitely should have shown up by now. So if at some point in time uh, in the archaeological record we ever have those, those civilizations show up, well, then we're going to have to deal with that. Does that make sense? I mean, we need to deal with truth, whatever that truth is. And so we, we just need to understand that we have been criticized and we have been critical, but we need to be able to point to the fact that the New Testament is, in the end, historically reliable. Okay. So here are, again, those 12 points that show Christianity is true. We've, we've shown already truth uh, about reality is knowable. We've shown that the opposite of true is false. And that has, that with, if there's a truth, there has to be a false side of that. We have to be able to point to the falseness as well as the truthfulness of something. Uh, it is true that the theistic God exists. Uh, if God exists, then miracles are possible. That's what we did last time as miracles. Miracles can be used to confirm the message of God. And then today we're looking at this New Testament historical reliability. We've already done seven and eight in short, and I've made that very brief, but now we're going to get into the New Testament is historically reliable. So that's where we are in this total course of things. Okay, does anybody need to take a break here? I yeah, I need to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, to be honest. I'm going to be one minute. Okay, let's okay. Take, a, take a quick break. Take five. I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, and we'll be back in five. I'm going to leave everything on, but I'm just going to stop the recording here. There we go. Yep. All right. So, uh, let me get our screen back up here and, uh, let's, let's look at a couple of the objectors to the reliability of scripture. Now, as, as Geisler goes into these, he doesn't tell you on the front end what I'm, what I'm going to tell you now that'll help make sense of why he's bringing these people up. Some of these people are represented as being biblical experts. Anytime you see, I'm, I'm, I'm making a bold, broad statement right here, but I'm, I'm confident that it's true. It's been historically true. I think it'll be true in the future. Anytime you see uh, NCR, uh, PBS, national broadcasting system, uh, any of these public uh, forums of, of news or documentaries bring on biblical experts. Huh. They will bring on people from the Jesus Seminar. Now, the Jesus Seminar is a group of people, about 100 people, who have gathered together to determine, get this, to determine how much of the Bible is reliable, authentic, and true. Wow. That's oh. who they are. And it's, yeah. when you hear names... That's their purpose. Yeah. Oh. When, you, when you hear names like John Dominic Crossan, who is the guy that's most often interviewed by National Geographic Channel, 
<laughs> Anytime you see something by National Geographic Channel about the so-called historical Jesus, I use air quotes there, uh, they're, they're going to quote somebody from the Jesus Seminar, usually John Dominic Crossan. So they, they get together and they, what they do is they've got little black beads and little white beads. And so they'll read a text <laughs> from the scripture and then they'll all go around the room with their all hundred of them. And they got a little bag that they pass around the room. And if they believe that the, the text that they read from scripture is authentic, and these are usually quotes from Jesus or miracles that Jesus performed or miracles that others performed. They'll put, if they believe the quote, they'll put a little white bead in the bag. If they don't believe the quote, they'll put a little black bead in the bag. So that's who the Jesus Seminar are. They're supposedly scholars. Now, I'm not saying they're not well-educated. They are well-educated. They, but they don't, they're not believers. So the Jesus Seminar is making these statements. And then when National Geographic quotes them, they'll say things, well, 82% of the people who are experts within the Jesus Seminar don't believe that, that this text is true or authentic. They don't believe this is actually a quote of Jesus Christ. So they bring question to the authenticity of scripture right from the outset. And they're, they're promoted and published as being the experts, the his, historians, and the theological scholars of the of biblical text. So these are the guys that are being pushed out there as the experts with, uh, with, within these public service kind of um, documentaries that are being done. And a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians are tuning in to these guys and believing what they're saying. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. So here's, here's their conclusions from the Jesus Seminar. 82% of the Bible or the New Testament, this is quoting the New Testament, 82% of the New Testament is not authentic. Mm. So uh, now you remember I said, if you could point to any one lie in the New Testament or the Bible, you have reason to question all of it. Mm -hmm. Now here's the problem. If any one thing can be proven to be wrong, who is to say what else is right or what else is wrong? It all unravels. It, it, it all comes apart. You're exactly right. You're right, You're right Prince. It unravels. It, it all comes apart. They said 16% yeah. of the New Testament is doubtful whether it's authentic. Wow. And if you add, add those two numbers together, 98% of the total New Testament is in doubt. These are the theological experts that are most often quoted. So remember that name, John Dominic Cross, and you'll hear other guys that are quoted there, but he's, he's the primary guy that you'll see. Uh, if you remember the guy that played my favorite Martian on television, he kind of looks like him. Yeah. And here, here's the interesting thing. Uh, even though it says here the Jesus seminar and, and the, those statistics are relative to what they believe about the Gospels. However, what they say as a prelude to this uh, uh, percentages and everything like that is that the, the Gospels are indicative, you know, to what else is in the New Testament. So you could just like pastors, then you could substitute doubts most of the New Testament. Okay, let's look at this guy. This guy, Bart Erdman. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he wrote a book called Misquoting Jesus, uh, which, as Geisler points out, he does quite a bit of misquoting Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Erdman is a, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure if he's still a professor, but he was a professor at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. So mm -hmm. I hate to point to these guys all being from Charlotte, North Carolina, because that's where I come to you from. But this is, this is what we were fighting in Charlotte. Ehrman was right there in our back door. Uh, he was constantly on television and in the news. And, and he was a guy, Geisler doesn't tell you this in his videos, but he was a student of Geisler. 
So he didn't study under bad guys. He went to Dallas. He w- he went to Moody. Uh, he w- he was a stud. He studied under Geisler at Dallas. He didn't finish at Dallas, but he did finish at Moody. But here are some things he says about New Testament manuscripts. He says in these New Testament manuscripts, uh, copies all different from one another. In other words, they they don't match up. They're not consistent. They're, they don't have continuity. Yeah. In many thousands of places, they don't match up. These copies differ from each other in so many places that we don't even know how many differences there are. Mark did not say the same thing as Luke. John is different from Matthew, <clears throat> not the same. Paul is different from Acts, and James is different from Paul, misquoting Jesus, pages 10 and, and 12. So here is kind of his introduction to his book. He's trying to lay the stage for, uh, or lay this, the, the format for the rest of his book, uh, saying that that the text, the Bible text, don't have any credibility at all. Now, let me just point out the obvious here. Uh, these kind of claims made don't make them true. <laughs> but many Christians will read this stuff just like they they read, uh, uh, you know, some the, some of these novels that are out there and then attributed them to being true. It's yeah, the Da Vinci Code and others. Uh, they read these things and they, they say, well, that, that's true. Well, they read this statement and they say, well, that's true. But let's, in, let's, let's investigate what actually he's talking about as we go through the rest of our apologetic studies. Because that's what we're, one of the things we're going to do is talk about the credibility of the text. Now, here's, here's, hold on to your thought there, Michael, just a minute. Here's one of the things that we'll learn from attorneys in the process of if you're presenting a case in a courtroom, if you have two people that have identical stories, in other words, it sounds like they're word for word stories, chances are they conspired. Why? Because if you have an accident on the quarter of third, on the corner of third and Main Street, an automobile accident, and you've got a witness, you got witnesses on all four corners of that intersection, the chances are you're going to get four very different perspectives and views of that accident. Well, it looked like car A ran a red light and car B plowed into it. No, the the light was green, another witness says, or the light was yellow and he was just trying to get through the light and the other car plowed into him. You're going to get a lot of different stories But in the end, if you start boiling those things down, you get to the the truth of the matter. What you're dealing with is a human perspective. Let me me give you an example that that Ehrman often points to. One gospel says there was one angel at the tomb when the women got there. Mm. Another gospel says there were two angels at the tomb when when the women got there. The tomb was empty, but one, one gospel says there was two angels. Another gospel says there was one angel. So Geisler, I don't think, dealt with that in, in the videos so far. But what would you guess would be a Geisler kind of response to that? There were two women there. There were two women there. That's a good, good response. Why, why would that make a difference? Because they had different variations of how many angels there were, but, but and the natural fact that only matters was that both women were there and both eyewitnesses had the same statement on that. Exactly, Ken. And what so? So one woman reported. Good job, back, Ken. One woman reported back to one of the writers of the Gospels that she saw one angel. Another woman reported back to the writer, another writer of the gospel, that she saw two angels. And Geisler's response is, well, if there was two angels, there was at least one angel. <laughs> so he, he does it mathematically, what I, what I did just from a witness standpoint. <laughs> so uh, understand that a lot of this is, is wordplay. 
a lot of this is mm. uh, taking the the words of the scriptures and trying to manipulate an argument. And that's the this is one of the reasons. Listen to me very carefully. This is one of the reasons it's so important to be able to form a proper syllogism and recognize a false one when it's presented. Amen. Because when you recognize these very technical matters, but true matters, when you recognize them for what they are, you can begin to take them apart. If you don't recognize them, then you can't, you, you're not even going to try to take them apart. You're, you're more likely to accept them and not be able to defend the text. Mm. Here's another guy, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I think he also taught in Charlotte for a while at University of North Carolina. Uh, Tabor says there's no miracles. The Gospels have errors, he says, and, and contradictions. Uh, miracle stories are not true, including the virgin birth, resurrection, because women do not get pregnant without a male, ever, and dead bodies don't rise, not if <clears throat> one is clinically dead. Jesus surely was after the Roman crucifixion and three days in the tomb. His inference is, so Jesus could not have been risen from the dead. Now, what does he do there? Why, why does his argument so, sound so convincing? He said he's not saying anything positive about any about any of the miracles because maybe he's more in doubt and he believes it, but he doesn't want to see the reality in it. Here, here's his here's his setup. His setup is there are no miracles. That's why last time we defended miracles and why i told you that the, the defending miracles was so important if you begin your argument your syllogism with the premise premise one there are no miracles you are you are beginning with a premise that ought to be a conclusion <laughs> okay so uh, he uh, begins with there are no miracles therefore there can be no virgin birth there can be no resurrection why? Because women don't get pregnant and dead bodies don't rise from the dead. It's obvious. Therefore, there is no miracles. Okay, therefore, there is no miracles. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. All right. So you just if you can't if you can't recognize an improper syllogism, an improper argument, you're never going to be able to defend the faith well. Hmm. You need to be able to, to recognize it. Now, I think, Chris, it was you that asked the question last time, do you need, able, need to be able to do this on the fly? Well, eventually, if you look at enough of these, it, it's going to jump out at you like a sore thumb. But if you don't yeah. look at enough of them, if you don't inspect them, if you don't, if you don't find out why they are not true, then you, you never get to the place that you go, well, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. What's wrong? And then go back and look at it again, which is the place we need to be in. Okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Evidence for New Testament reliability. Okay. Now let's let's talk about why what historically is looked at when somebody's looking at a document in history. Let's take let's take the scriptures out of it for the moment. When somebody's looking for historical reliability and they're looking at documents from history. What are they looking for? Well, one of the things they look for is how many different manuscripts are there? How many copies uh, are there and are they copied accurately? Can we, can we say that, can we prove that they're accurately copied? Because why? There weren't printing presses. There were yeah. scribes sitting down making copies of these things. And so we have to know that they were copied accurately and that we need to know that the events were recorded accurately. Now, let's just take the events of today. As I was flipping through the channels before I came on here today, I saw a lot of different perspectives of the events taking place in Washington, DC. And as I went through as I went through the channels, I heard a lot of different stories 
concerning the events, I saw a lot of different uh, videos of specific events in different places in different times throughout the day that as they were presented in, a, in order, or I should say were presented out of order, you assumed they were being presented in order, then the events took on a very different reality. They told a different story. So we want to, we want to know, number one, the documents are copied accurately. And we're going, to, we're going to talk about how we identify that in just a moment. And we want to know that the events were recorded accurately. Go ahead, Michael. I was going to say, you can be doing this really quickly. Um, Chris, are you taking notes on this? Yes. Why? Is Ken taking notes on this? Yes. Am I taking notes on this? Yes. Well, we're three. We're watching the same thing, and we're each taking notes. I can guarantee you, my notes are going to be different than Chris's notes, and Chris's notes are going to be different than than Ken's notes. Yet we're seeing the same event. Yet we're going to come, but because we're different people, and we're going to we're going to, we're going to emphasize different things. The Gospels, same events, Amen. written down by four different people, emphasizing different parts, but still coming from the same source. And so, what, like we are writing notes Amen. on this, emphasizing different things coming from the same source. And so, what do investigators do when they're when they're investigating something in history or a crime, for example? What do investigators do? They talk to they all gather the everything. They talk to all the witnesses, they look at forensic evidence, they look at physical evidence, they look at all of these things and they put the pieces together. That's what historians are called on to do. Historians are called on to look at all of Amen. the information, look at it and you find out is it copied accurately. We're gonna talk about accurate copies in just a moment. And we're gonna look at events and ask, are they recorded accurately? Or were they recorded with bias? I mean, if I'm talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I'm getting, uh, I'm getting events only from Christian people. The question is, am I getting an accurate picture of that? Well, I, I haven't given you all the information. What if all those Christian people that I'm getting the the information from were threatened for with their life if they gave that information out? Now I'm giving you a different perspective. But what if them are they're not all Christian people? What if some of them are Jews? What if some of them are are historians that don't that are not believers or not Jews at all? What what if I'm getting information from a guy like Josephus, who is who is not uh, not a friend of Christians whatsoever, but I'm getting evidence from the records of Josephus that the Jesus's tomb was empty on the third day. Well, then that's pretty credible evidence because he's giving out information that is not helpful to his calling as a Jewish historian. Does that make sense? Amen. So you put all these pieces yeah. together and you begin to ask, okay, so these two things we're going to talk about, documents copied accurately or events recorded accurately. Documents are copied accurately, uh, Geisler claims. So how do we know that? How do we know the documents are copied accurately? We have copies of them. Okay, well, let's let's talk uh, about the, uh, the chart that I'm gonna show you in a minute. We gotta ask ourselves, how many copies do we have? Wow. So that's the first that's thing. Right? How many <laughs> copies do we have? <laughs> we uh, have 1,800 copies with more that they have found. Okay, so how close are those copies made to the at the time of the actual events 25 years and and more accurately if i've got several copies can i discern from those different copies what they actually say if pieces of all of them are missing so that those are the things we're going to attack just in the next minute we we're going to suggest here in fact i'm going to claim boldly and prove it to you, uh, I think pretty mightily through the evidence. Most of this evidence was accumulated by, by guys like Josh McDowell um, and William Lane Craig, by the way, who I'll mention later on. Uh, but these guys dug this information up. 
and and they they ask themselves, okay, how does this compare to other books of the ancient world? In other words, if we took books and people, historical figures at the, uh, that were from the same time that Jesus lived or the same time as the crucifixion or the time right after that, if we took just documents or just people from that time frame, what kind of evidence do we have for them being actual people that lived or actual documents that reflected the truth? So those, that's the reason these questions are important. This chart, you need, you need to study significantly. And let me, let me explain to you, if you haven't looked at it in detail, what this is. These gray bars, this little gray bar right here and this gray bars here, these gray bars represent the time gap between the events in history and when we have documents that record them. So for instance, in all of Homer's writings, the closest documents we have to the time that Homer lived are 400 years after he lived. So the question is without printing presses, how, how do we know that we've got accurate representation of what he actually wrote? Well, a lot, of, a lot of that might depend on how many documents there were to, to go from to begin with. Well, there's 1,800 documents. That's a lot of documents. I mean, historically from this time frame, that's, that's a mammoth number of documents that we've got. But the first ones are 400 years after he lived. Now, if, if I spoke today and there was no video recording and I, or I wrote and there was no printing press and those documents degraded over time, uh, I'm going to end up with pieces or fragments, if anything ever exists at all, a thousand years from now. With regard to what I do, I suspect there'll be no record of it a thousand years from now. But yeah. you've got guys like Homer, <laughs> and you got guys like uh, the, the Apostle Paul. Uh, those records are going to go on a long time. Demosthenes. Uh, 1400 years after he lived are the first records we have of anything from him. Wow. 1400 years after he lived. And how many do we have? About a hundred. Herodotus, 1400 years after he lived, we only have eight documents. And yet this guy is, is written up and is recording many historical events accurately and nobody questions nobody questions his records plato his writings 1200 years after he lived was the first writings or the first documents first manuscripts we have and we only have seven of those <laughs> and yet nobody questions whether plato wrote them tacitus famous historian the closest records we have to the time after he lived are, are a thousand years after he lived, the, the manuscripts were written or copied, and we only have about 20 of those right now. I think there's actually 21 right now. Mm. Caesar Augustus, I often use this in sermons when I'm preparing a sermon. I'll say something, if I'm giving an apologetic sermon, I'll say something like this. Did you know there is more evidence for the fact that Jesus was born, that he lived a perfect life, that he did miracles, that he was crucified, dead, and buried, and that he was resurrected. Do you know there's more historical evidence for that, non-biblical historical evidence for that, than, the than all the writings and all the things concerning the fact that Julius Caesar ever lived? <laughs> Stupid. Amen. Oh my God. And it's overwhelming. I mean, look at this. Look at this. Ten manuscripts, a thousand oh. years after he lived. And this is recording Julius Caesar. And we have, well, it's, it's now over 6,000 manuscripts. Wow. I think it's about 6,300 manuscripts. So th this timeline is even old and outdated. And the we have them within 25 years of, of the life of Jesus Christ. 
Hmm. So it's it's pretty overwhelming. If you really study this chart, it is it's uh, it is is mind boggling how much information we have. By far, the most evidence we have for any events in history come from New Testament manuscripts that we have in hand. Now the question becomes, okay, so what, what are these manuscripts we got, which are now number about 6,300? What are the manuscripts? Do we have whole copies of them? Do we have just pieces of them? Because I, I have seen with my own eyes a manuscript of a portion of the book of John Fragments. That, that dates back to about 20 years, 23 oh. years after the life of Christ. Oh. But that manuscript, that manuscript is just a piece of the book of John that's about that big. But we can take it and we can identify the words and we can place exactly what part of John they came out of. Why? Because we have whole manuscripts of the book of John. So we can take yeah. that piece and we can place it in there like a puzzle and say, right there it is, word for word, perfect, like it is. So that's part of the part of the 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 story here of how these things are actually put together. Westcott and Hort, who are uh, good theological scholars, estimated that only about one sixteenth uh, sixtieth arise. Uh, in other words. The, the translations arise as being not exact translations. In other words, when the, when the scribes were making the copies, that there would be a scribal error. And they would say, this comes out to mean that in scribal errors, that 98.33% of all the texts we have, all 6,300 of the text, uh, of the manuscripts that we have, the different manuscripts we have, 98.33% are identical to one another. They're pure. Ezra Abbott says that 99.75% of what he has investigated are pure. A.T. Robinson, an excellent uh, theologian and scholar and investigator of these kinds of things, says that 99.9% .9 are pure. Schaff says that of the estimated 150,000 variations, in other words, scribal errors that might have been made, as, as he would say, this is, this is uh, let's put it in English terms, this is an A, I'm going to copy an A over here, and that's the way they actually did it. They didn't write whole words, they wrote individual letters because they didn't want to make any mistakes. But inevitably, humans make mistakes. So they would do one letter and one letter and one letter and one letter. Uh, of the, 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 he says there's about 150,000 variations where we know there are scribal errors. Only about 400 affected the sense of a particular passage. In other words, okay, what would that mean if that one letter was incorrect? Or maybe the scribe skipped the whole word and he's put another word in the wrong place. About 400 different ones of those affected the sense of what was being said. 50 of, were of real significance in terms of were they important to the text? But he says this, Schaff says not one affected an article of the Christian faith. Not one had an effect on what we believe as Christians. So the question is, how much of that can we piece together? Uh, how, do we, how do we accomplish that? So you, you probably saw this in the, in the Geisler video, and I've used this a, a lot as I did prison ministry. We had a lot of challenges from Muslims on this, were the copies you know, accurate because Muslims don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of information or documentation of what they say they believe. And certainly nothing as close as we've got, although their, their faith is very much younger than ours. They don't have a lot of original documents. But he says this, he says, would you question what this was saying if you 
we're missing the O here or missing the U here or missing the H here. If you had all three of these, and these were capitalized, but these were not capitalized, would you yet, if you had all three manuscripts, would you have any question about what it said? Nope. No. So the fact that we have all of these different manuscripts, over 6,300 manuscripts at this point in time, do you think that if you could lay them side by side, you would have any question about what they said in the end? No. Obviously, no. Even with mistakes, 100% of the message comes through. In fact, Geisler makes the argument, and I think this is a difficult argument to follow, but it is, it, it's a legitimate argument, that the more errors you have, the more sure you are of the message. In other words, if you have a lot of manuscripts and some of them have errors in it, but you have hundreds or thousands of manuscripts of that same passage, you're going to figure out pretty effectively what they actually say. Amen. Okay. So let's move on to the testimony of the early fathers. Now, I, I didn't think Geisler did a particular good um, job of saying why this was important. So let me lay out the case before I make the argument. The case is this. The case is that even if we had zero manuscripts, we say we've got about 6,300 manuscripts today. But even if we had zero manuscripts of the text, there are enough of the early church fathers that quote the texts that you could put together nearly all of the New Testament. So the early church fathers, let's say in the first three centuries, Justin Martyr made 268 quotations from the Gospels. So even if we had no record of gospel manuscripts, we could go back to just what, Joe, what Justin Martyr quoted and come up with a large portion of the Gospels. Huh. Arrhenius has over a thousand quotes of the Gospels. Oh. Clement of Alexander, over a thousand. But look at this, Origen, over 9,200 mentions or direct quotes from the Gospels. Grand total here of just these few writers, just these few, are over 19,000 quotes from the New Testament. More than Bible. So we could pretty much put together all of the New Testament, even if we had zero manuscripts. <laughs> but we have the manuscripts, and what they quote matches the manuscripts we have. So there is a double certification that what we have is actually pretty accurate to what is going on here. So the conclusions are these. We have more manuscripts. We have earlier manuscripts closer to the events in time. And they're more accurately copied. We know that because we have more and we can compare them. And we can compare them to the early church father quotes than any other book from ancient, the ancient world. And matter of fact, if you add up all those books that we showed you from the ancient world, that doesn't even come close. You add all the others together, they don't come close to having the credibility of the New Testament. Amen. So uh, there's more writers, earlier writers, more accurate writers than for any other book in the ancient world. There were earlier writers, there were eyewitness writers. In other words, it's hard to pull off a forgery if there were eyewitnesses to the events that are still living. Amen. So if we've got eyewitnesses that are still living and I write, okay, I saw uh, this guy get knocked down by a car and get killed and be pronounced dead. And four days later, he was walking around on the earth alive and, and there were eyewitnesses to that then that would be credible maybe. But if I have that, if I report that event a thousand years after the event and there are no eyewitnesses alive, then there's nothing to attribute to that except legend. Does everybody follow me? Mm -hmm. yes, if, there no, if there are no yeah. eyewitnesses and I reported a thousand years after the event, which we just saw in some of those, that diagram that, we, that I showed you, that graph that I showed you, then 
all that can be pointed to is say, well, that's a nice story. Sounds like a, an interesting legend, but we have no eyewitnesses. On the other side of that, if we have eyewitnesses that I report something false about, and I report the guy was dead for four days and got up when he was walking around, and there were eyewitnesses say, no, he just got knocked down by the car. He got right back up. And he's walking around. It's hard to pull off that forgery if the eyewitnesses are still alive and say, no, he never got killed. He just got knocked down by the car. Are you with me? Yep. So both of those things are true. Legends happened a thousand years after the event. Eyewitnesses are present. It's hard to pull off a farce. We have both of those bases covered. We have eyewitnesses and we're written within 20 years of the event in time. So this, this chart becomes very important in terms of defending your faith. And you need to be able, you need to put this back in your arsenal somewhere and at least be able to reference it at some point if you're having this kind of discussion with somebody. And listen to me. I had this discussion when I first got here six years ago with about three different guys out on the street of streets of Garberville. Yep. <laughs> and I pulled this chart up on my phone and I said, look at this. And I had, I, and they said, well, we don't believe that. Well, I said, well, why don't you go back and investigate and see if anything I'm telling you here is not true. I've said, I've got, I've got some text at the church that, that will be, that are not written by Christians that will tell you that, that what I've doc, have documented here is true. Mm-hmm. So those kind of things become important as apologists that we have these tools uh, in our in our tool belt, so to speak. There are new, numerous scholars that hold New Testament is based in eyewitness testimony, and this just lists a few of them. Let me bring to your attention a few of these. D. A. Carson is a guy that uh, that teaches at Moody, and uh, is an, an excellent scholar. William Lane Craig right here, knowing the truth about the resurrection is one of the best books ever written about the resurrection. And I traveled with William Lane Craig in Africa. We were on a conference uh, circuit together. Uh, I was sort of a warm up speaker for him. And William Lane Craig is one of the most brilliant men that I've ever had the pleasure of getting to know. He and his wife uh, were together there in Southern Africa and we traveled from Cape Town all the way down in Southern Africa, all the way up to Johannesburg in uh, the northern parts of, of South Africa, uh, right at the Botswana line. Uh, we, we traveled all over Africa together and uh, his, his information there, anything you can find of his online on YouTube is excellent. Another guy that I'll point you to is Gary Habermas. He's probably uh, the number one biblical scholar today on the historical evidences for Jesus, and that is to mention all the, the, the non-biblical evidences for Jesus's life, death, burial, and resurrection being true. And Gary Habermas uh, was a lecturer at Southern Evangelical Seminary where I graduated on a number of occasions. He speaks at the Apologetics Conference about every year, and uh, I've had dinner with him. He's a, he's a, he's a brilliant, brilliant scholar. Uh, a guy that you want to get to know better. And then uh, who is that pastor? Gary Habermas. Okay. Gary Habermas. And N.T. Wright. Uh, I actually ate at the same table with N.T. Wright in Charlotte, North Carolina a few years ago. And uh, he and his wife were both there and Elvin and I were both there at the same table. And he's, he's another excellent scholar. And it says, can we trust the gospels? And he's written a lot of these evidences down as well. Another guy I want to point you to that that Geisler did not mention, and, and there's actually a reason Geisler doesn't mention Michael Lacona, is that Geisler and Lacona uh, have some differences of opinion uh, concerning some of the things that, that Michael uh, accepts as evidence and some of the things Geisler rejects as evidence. I won't get into the details of that right here, but Michael Lacona is a personal friend. Uh, I respect Lacona. I respect Geisler, but Michael Lacona has written a 700 page book just on the evidences for the resurrection of Christ. Hmm. This is not to speak of his life, his miracles or any of that, but just the resurrection of Christ, 700 pages. 
and it's a histographical approach. And what he does is he takes all of these historians, uh, first, second, third history historians, modern day historians, uh, chases the evidence and looks at it from strictly historical perspective and, and, say, and gives the historical perspective for the evidences for the resurrection. I commend this book to you if you want to get to know Michael. Uh, both his daughter and his son-in-law were members of our church in Charlotte before I came here. Um, and they both live, and Michael lives in Atlanta, Georgia right now. Okay, so the timeline that Geisler gave you is another good way of looking at this in terms of the time in which these books were written of the Bible. Here's the cross, about 33 AD. Uh, the creeds are all written in this time frame right in here. Uh, let's, let's give or take, you know, a, a three or four year period of time, the early creeds. Uh, First Corinthians is written right in here about 56 AD. The book of Acts, 61, 62, 63. The book of James just after that. All of Paul's writings just after that. And the destruction of the temple at 70 AD. So most of the New Testament is written all for the destruction of the temple. Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, Mark, Luke, uh, all written before uh, 65 AD. So all written within about 30 years, not a thousand years, not 1500 years, but about 30 years of the time of Jesus Christ. And, uh, they, they can prove that because any of the writers, they said, uh, uh, Geyser was saying, because these writers would have wrote the destruction of the temple. They would have wrote all the other terrible things that happened after those dates, and none of them mentioned it. So that dates it, just like the, when they brought up uh, Pilate and all the other big wigs that were there or in their writings. And then, so that dates when they were written and there's no historical destruction that took place after those years. Exactly, Kim. They, they, uh, no respectable historian, uh, believer, unbeliever, Jew, Gentile, pagan, Christian would have ever written anything after 70 AD or in that time frame without mentioning the destruction of the temple. It, it would be unheard of. So you're right. We can peg the timelines in here besides the documents that we have, we can peg the timelines by what's being reported. So yeah, ob obviously written in that time frame. Mm -hmm. No time for myths to, do, to be uh, created. Uh, myths have to be created. It, it, this uh, William Lane Craig says it takes at least two generations to create a myth. I mean, if you see myths about the Greek gods, they're all created. Uh, thousands of years or at least hundreds of years after they say that the events happened. Uh, those are legendary tendencies. Me reporting a, something that happened a thousand years after the event when there's no eyewitnesses is pretty easy to create a legend. But to, to report events close to time, uh, there was no time in here in that timeline that I just gave you for myths to be created. So the historical cross here is the year AD 29. Uh, this is written. Here's, um, look at all the detail that's written here. Exact dates, exact people, it gives them, it tells who they are. This is the guy's the governor. This guy's the tetriarch of Galilee, the brother of Philip, tetriarch, uh, you know, uh, tetriarch, high priest. Uh, and so he says, all of this came to me uh, God, all these words came to me from God to John, the son of Zechariah in the desert, Luke 3. So detail after detail after detail after detail. They give exact dates that can be confirmed. They give eight people known in history to secular literature and sec secular historians, and all were known to live in the exact time frame. This is not a once upon a time story or a myth. These are historical events that are recorded. And so those kinds of evidences are typical 
of biblical writing. It's not, it's not an oddity, but they're typical of biblical writings if you look at them. I've already given the example of Alexander the Great, but let's just look at some of the details of that. Um, sources that were contemporary to Alexander the Great that wrote about him, uh, none. There were no people that lived during his time that wrote about him. Uh, they were all at least 100 years after, and we only had fragments of the, those records 100 years after. Three to 500 years later, we have several histories that are then written about Alexander the Great that came from stories that were told or legends over time. So New Testament, within 20 to 30 years later, the whole life of Jesus Christ is spelled out. This is why I give this one as, as being so predominant. It's an easy one for people to understand. There's more evidence for the life, death, burial, resurrection, perfect life of Jesus Christ, miracles he did, all of those things, not just the life of Jesus, but all of those details concerning the life of Jesus, including his physical resurrection, than for the fact that, that Alexander the Great even lived or that Julius Caesar even lived. Pretty, pretty impressive. And those are bullet points you can make. You don't have to give a whole lot of detail in a sermon, but you can spell out these bullet points and make, make a distinction there. So keep this chart in mind as you go forward here. Okay, so there are more accurate writers. They're tested to by as early, uh, possibly 40 to 60 AD. In other words, just 20 to 30, 25 to 30 years after the events. Uh, probably the, all of the writings by 60. Uh, during the life uh, time of eyewitnesses, much earlier than the other ancient books of Alexander the Great or others. So let's look at the authentic nature of the writings. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip the first six. Geisler does a really good job of talking about those. Let me just cover these last from seven to 12 quickly. They did not deny, deny the testimony. These eyewitnesses did not deny the testimony of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection even at the threat of their death. That's an impressive testimony. When you're saying, do you want to make this, this uh, affirmation? And if you do, we're going to kill you. <clears throat> and they do anyway. That, that's a pretty strongly held belief. They claimed to, to their record was based on eyewitness accounts. They had women addressing the resurrection before men. That would never happen in Jewish history. Women weren't even given uh, credit in a court of law. You had to have uh, several women to give an account of something that happened to even be heard in a court of law, let alone their testimony to be accepted. They challenged readers to check out the facts. So they, they didn't try to cover up any of these things. They didn't say, you know, this is this, just, just accept this. This is true. I mean, this, we're hearing this a lot today politically. Just accept this. It's true or from the news media, just accept this, it's true. Well, show me the facts, show me the facts. And I don't care who it is, we, we should be asking for the evidence. They discarded long held Jewish beliefs overnight. Why would the Jews who were converted to believing in Christ as Messiah, lay down everything that had been taught for thousands of years by Jewish believers at the, at the risk of their family disowning them? That, that's strong. God said so. Being thrown out of the temple. You can't come here and worship anymore. If you, if you say this, you can't come here and worship anymore. You're a, you're a blasphemer if you say this and you hold this belief. And they, yet they held the belief and discarded those beliefs overnight and those, those rituals overnight. And they include more, to, more than 30 historical people that are not biblical, uh, people that are only recorded of in the Bible, but people that are recorded in secular history as well. So uh, again, you can listen to Geisler in more detail on that, but that's, uh, that's the gist of what I want you to remember. One of the best, as Geisler said in this, is Colin Himmer, uh, acts of setting the Hellenic record or the Hellenic history. Uh, he covers a lot of the, the minute geographical details, specialized details that only special groups would know that we had no record of until archaeology proved that they were true, details appropriate to a period that no other period of time they were appropriate to. For instance, the crucifixion, there, were, there was no time in history 
much prior to Christ's time of any uh, recordings of crucifixions. And yet we have 700 year old prophecies that talk about the crucifixion events that reflect immediacy. Uh, in other words, they were happening right then, right now. Uh, they knew uh, particular Id idioms, in other words, particular um, phrases. Uh, we, we use phrases to talk about things. We'll say, uh, well, um, what's a good idiom? Uh, you, uh, you look like that. When somebody says something that, that um, is indicative of, of his lifestyle, well, you look like that. Well, that's, that's an idiom that wouldn't have been understood a thousand years ago, but it's understood today. Uh, verification of numerous details and times. All of these things are, are things that we can look to to point to uh, the facts actually being true. Okay. Um, I'm going to go probably about five minutes over here, but we'll, we'll finish up at about five after. Uh, okay. So a couple of books that you'll want to be aware of that are, these are good books to hand out to people who are not scholars. And the reason I think Geisler put them in here, these are non-scholarly books that are written for the non-scholar but they point to scholarly events and the scholarly things that, that are good proofs. Uh, Thomas Sherlock, The Trial and Witness of the Resurrection. Trial and Witnesses of the Resurrection. Frank Morris, Who Moved the Stone, this book that's, that's pictured here. That's, that's a classic. Uh, Christianity and History by John Montgomery. The one that I like to give out to people is A Case for Christ, Lee Strobel. I've also got, I've got my picture online somewhere with Lee. Uh, Lee was also at a lot of the, the uh, apologetics conferences in, in North Carolina over the years. And I was actually his chauffeur gopher uh, a couple of those years where I got to, to chauffeur him around to his hotel and back and, and uh -huh. take him to dinner and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, Lee, Lee's one of the funniest human beings on earth. I think, you know, he's, he uh, is. if you, yep. If you listen to his stories, he's uh, he, he is he's an interesting guy, but he's a funny guy. And then J. Warner Wallace, uh, Cold Case Christianity. War J. Warner Wallace was an investigative uh, analyst and attorney, and he looks at forensic and historical evidences for Christ. He he was like like Josh McDowell. He was not a believer set out to prove that Christianity was false and came to be a believer. Just looking at the evidences. Yeah, I actually have one. I was, I was, when I was talking the other day and I, and the, and when I, when he mentioned that name, I was like, dang, I really would love to have one of his books. Yeah. And it, lo and behold, there was one in the library. Cool. Oh. That's good. But yeah. Forensic, forensic faith. It's the third of the three books that he wrote. Yeah. Richard, yeah. Yeah. He, he was an L.A. forensic cold case detective. Yep. And, and attorney, he was a trained attorney as well. Uh, so the following New Testament events are affirmed. I'm not going to run through these. You can see them here. You can also see a, a, a slide that's very similar to this in, in Geisler's uh, videos. The testimonies from archaeology. The significance of archaeology is that we continue to get uh, evidence uh, almost weekly if you if you subscribe to the archaeological journals you'll see confirmations confirmations of, of biblical text being true it, it is remarkable uh, how quickly these things are coming on today and so don't discount archaeology as a good evidence for the reliability of scripture archaeologically archaeology affirms the bible uh, and this is what uh, Scheller says about this. In extraordinary ways, modern archaeology has affirmed the historical core of the Old and New Testaments. Now, what's, what's particularly interesting about this? Scheller's a non-believer. Yeah. Yeah. He says they're collaborating key portions of the stories of the Israel, Israel, Israel's patriarchs, the Exodus, the Davidic monarchy, and the life and times of Jesus. 
by a total atheist. N US News and World Report. And let me just say this. Go back to that slide. Oh, yeah. Put up, will you put up 45 again for one second? I'm going to take a screenshot of it. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Got it? Yeah. Okay. So let's go, let's go back to this. Here's my statement. I would be willing to say to you, I'm not a betting man, but I would bet you in the years ahead, you will not see this kind of statement come out of U.S. News and World Report or any similar publication. Hello. Christianity is, is coming under attack, folks. The setup is, is the setup was today for advancing and increasing with dramatic increase in intensity the attack on Christians and Christianity. So apologists, just get ready for it. You're you're in for it. So the summary of the evidence is 10 good reasons for accepting the New Testaments. There were nine different authors. In other words, it wasn't one person making up this stuff. Uh, the nine authors uh, all died for their faith with the except, possible exception of one, the Apostle John. Uh, 27 different books. They were based on eyewitness testimonies. They were early accepted by Pauline letters, confirmed them. Uh, and all of these, by the way, are evidences for how generally history or historical documents are accepted as being true or false. Mm -hmm. It's not just biblical history. It's secular history as well is how, is how we're judging this. There was no time for myths to develop. The nature of the records is authentic. Non-Christian sources support them. Hundreds of them, non-Christian sources, not the least of, of which is the guys like Tacitus and Josephus. Uh, noted Roman historians have confirmed them. Noted legal experts have vouched for them. Many archaeological finds have supported them. And let me just say this concerning that last one. No archaeological find, no archaeological find has ever, ever discredited the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Nothing like this exists in any other book from the ancient world. Nothing ever. So here's some of the implications. If true, then Jesus died and rose again. If true, Jesus did miracles to prove his claim to be God. And if all of that's true, then Christianity is true. Amen. There's a simple Beautiful. syllogism that two premises and a conclusion. If, 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 and true, true, true. And so we've already proved Jesus died and rose again with all the evidences that are there. Jesus did miracles to prove his claim to be God. Therefore, Christianity is true. Oh, yeah. So Q&A. Any questions, comments, other comments? I was thinking of so the guy that the um, atheist that you were talking about in the beginning, um, Earthman. Urban? And he was... Had me doing this, and he was saying one of the reasons that he didn't believe it because all the gospels were different. Mm -hmm. Believe me, if all the gospels were the same, he would just say, because I've been the devil's advocate and I actually have said this, if all the gospels were the same, then that would just mean that they were all plagiarized from the same source, and that would make them wrong. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's a good argument. That's actually a good legal argument in a court of law. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely right, Michael. Any other thoughts, comments, suggestions? Here, here's an interesting, Pastor, here's an interesting thing about this fellow, Ehrman, who, by the way, is still there at the University of North Carolina. I thought he was. And, uh, but he, he started <laughs> out, I mean, he was a believer. And he started out at Moody Bible Institute as a student, yep. graduated from what was then just a three-year program at the Institute, then went on and, and got his, his uh, uh, 
BA at Wheaton College, which is, was and still is an excellent school. However, he got his Master's of Divinity degree at Princeton Theological Seminary, yeah. which had, by the time uh, the fellow got there, it, was, it had gone pretty liberal. And the main course that he took, what attracted him to go there, was there were a lot of critics of scripture, and he studied the criticism of the New Testament. And in so doing, it shot holes the way they taught it, it, it seemingly shot holes in everything he'd been taught at Moody and Wheaton. So we got to be we got to be careful <coughs> in uh, what we what we choose to study. I mean, he he started out on a good track, but then decided, you know, uh, I'm going to take in take in this class on the on biblical criticism, and instead of looking at it, the class objectively and gaining some info like we do here, then he just went the other way and cashed in with the critics. Yeah. And Sad. actually, think about this. Uh, he and Geisler, before Geisler's death, both lived in Charlotte about four miles from each other. Mm. And he actually right. sat through an early version of this same apologetics class that you guys are taking right now. It yeah. wasn't exactly uh, the same then, but it was an early version of that. He sat in that class, audited the class under Geisler. And what's interesting, some of that class that he took at Princeton, one of the, I don't know whether he was a, a regular professor or, or a visiting professor, was Bruce Metzger, who was one of the men that you laid out. And Bruce, down through the years, taught solid theology yeah. and say this is the and, and plus he's an excellent apologist yeah. and he would share you know this is this is criticisms that people have and this is how you combat it but rather than Ehrman focusing in on the apologetics of it he focused in on the criticism and it's interesting that what Ehrman Ehrman takes the same approach that all of the new atheists essentially take yep and that is yep. that that he'll he'll proclaim something to be true and then go back and give premises that end in a conclusion that that started with the first premise that he had <laughs> and, and, and those are you know that's why these arguments need to be defined and identified as illegitimate arguments and that's, uh, you know, because they, they, they become very convincing. Ehrman is not an unconvincing guy. He is, he's pretty no. passionate. Uh, he, he debate, well, it wasn't really a debate. It was a discussion. He had a discussion on the historical reliability of the Bible with another friend of mine that, uh, that teaches now at, um, at Southern Evangelical Seminary uh, just before I left Charlotte. And uh, he was absolutely blown away by Richard Howe. I mean, he was absolutely blown away by Richard Howe. And then and the, the newspapers reported on it the next day. And then he came back as a disclaimer against that and said, well, it was all a setup because, uh, you know, I had, to, I had to do that whole thing inside of Southern Evangelical Seminary. Well, Richard had offered mm -hmm. to go to, to Charlotte or even to, to Ehrman's apartment and film this. And he wouldn't accept either one of mm -hmm. those. But then he complained about it the next day saying it was a setup because it was Southern Evangelical. But that was part of his agreement on the front end to do it there. And certainly there was nothing done that day that took away from his arguments. So his argument became and sort of a third party argument. I don't like the setup you guys had, but it didn't argue the points that he made that were mm -hmm. overcome by Richard Howe. So just just be aware that this is this is the tactic. And what, what was interesting about? Go ahead, Pastor. Yeah, and what was interesting in in, in his early days, way back in 1970, in the early 70s, Ehrman was on a championship national championship debate team, not debating theological stuff, but just a debate team in general, and 
he used that, you can see it in some of his writings, he used that expertise in debate and handling and writing the way he did. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. And Pastor, too. you're probably more familiar with him than I am by far. Yeah. Well, the other interesting thing, too, about this, this so-called conversation that really was is just sort of an informal debate, in my estimation, that he had with Richard Howe, is that was only about the third thing Richard had ever done. And Richard just ate his lunch, even with all of Ehrman's experience. So it, 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 was, it really is interesting that somebody that was, and, and Richard has said that after the fact. He has said, look, I went into this. I'd only had three debates in my life. And Ehrman's, Ehrman's had, you know, 15, 20 years of this. But, you know, even with that, if you just, as Geisler always says, if you just retreat to the facts, you stand on solid ground. And that, that's where we want to go with this. Okay, guys, let's let's finish this up. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, uh, when you're looking at the, the time charts for all the manuscripts from uh, the New Testament, Homer and Demonstrates and all that, is it safe to say that, well, obviously, all the manuscripts from all these guys down here, there was no eyewitnesses, there's uh, thousands of years past that they were all written by different authors. But the New, Te the New Testament, even the manuscripts that they've been finding all these years are still written by the original writers? Still written by the original writers. Now, that, the, the documents that we have, we're not claiming they're original documents but we are claiming they're accurate copies of the original documents. I mean, the, one of the okay. arguments that's been made is right. you, don't, you don't have any original documents. Well, we're not arguing that. We're just arguing that time frame is so short that we have accurate copies and that we have so many copies that we can compare them and know that they're accurate. That's all we're saying. So we're, we're not claiming to okay. have... thing with this you can pretty much say that about any book that is that old yeah and well look, look at just look that at that right? chart look at the chart and you'll see that some of them you know the first first documents that we have are a thousand years after and these yeah. we have within no, no, years. Okay. anything it was all written by somebody a thousand years later exactly wow. and, and this, this by the way is the same uh argument that we need to make against uh, the uh, new age guys and the guys that are promoting these false gospels like the gospel of Thomas or the gospel of Mary, all of those were written at least 400 years, if not a thousand years, some of them a thousand years after the life of Christ, but they claim to be written by the apostle Thomas or Jesus's mother, Mary, but we, wow. we know they weren't written to, you know, at the, in that time frame. And we have no other documents that would support their written. They're, they're false gospels. That's why they're called Gnostic gospels. Gnostic gospels. Oh, so the, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. So the accountability, I mean, the, uh, so they can't take into account because most of those are, no, no, I was, I was thinking the 400 years of silence. Di disregard. Never mind. Yep. Never mind. Okay. So the next classes are classes nine and 10 from Geisler. Okay. We'll have February the 10th at 3 p.m. We'll plan on doing that again by Zoom. If things change, we'll, we might can get together. But uh, I should have a recording of this. Let me get out of this screen. If you got that written down, do. We should have a recording of this up to you guys sometime in the next day or two. And you can go back and look over it again, get it to Donald since he wasn't able to join us. And I'll get this to our guys in North Carolina that were working uh, late today. So yeah, and I, took, I took screenshots of most everything. Okay, great. Good you enough. Question about uh, Surge, right? Hey, you, you need to know both of those. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. I understand. That's why I, that's why I told you it was a good question. Well, see, I, <laughs> see do your homework. See, the, the G, and I'm, I'm trying to find out in the, in, the, in the video, he's talking about the G is different than the, uh, the E. Anyways, my point is, or the, uh, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. See, the point is, is I, I don't understand if it's, uh, if it's uh, 
the energy at the edge of the universe is where the uh, galaxy seed stemmed from. Is it, is it a matter of uh, Hubble versus Kobe? Is it a matter of uh, time span? Or is it a matter of just a uh, new uh, discovery? Uh, you know, a lot of that, Chris, we're going to find out about with the new telescope that went up. It is okay. debatable among scholars. All those questions you're asking are debatable among scholars. Okay. Uh, they can't even tell you what dark matter is. They uh, can't tell you what dark energy is. Uh, they, just, they just claim that they have evidence that it's there, but they, they can't tell you what it is. And, and my question has been, because I'm, I'm not a scientist, my question is, if you don't know what it is, how do you, in, how do you identify that it is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. that? So that's, uh, that's, that's kind of what, uh, what I want you to be able to do is draw on that evidence when you run into somebody. Like we had one guy out on the square in Garberville that I had some of these conversations with about scientific evidence. Yeah, that he, he was far, far beyond where I am in terms of scientific knowledge. But I went back and gathered this information together and presented it to him and then said, you know, I, I'm not a scientist, but here's what I want you to know that, that that is known. Here's what I want you to know that is not known. And some of the stuff you're arguing is legitimately not known. Yeah. Okay. So we can't we can't make arguments for stuff we don't know. We should not make arguments for stuff we don't know. Hey, today, let me just give you an example. I was telling Elba a little bit earlier. Today, with all the stuff going on in Washington, I've been bombarded with photographs, with videos, with all kinds of stuff that say, look at this, look at this. This is this is Jesus smiling at us. This is Ooh. this. This is something else. This is something else. Uh, no, that's like saying you found the picture of Mother Mary in a piece of toast. You know, it, it's just <laughs> and us claiming that we've that that we believe this takes our credibility away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So be careful what you claim. Be careful what you attach your name to. Because your credibility as a Christ follower and as a teacher of the Gospels is on the line. Never jump on the bandwagon till, till there is proof that it's true. I don't care, you know, if it's archaeological evidence from a credible <clears throat> source until it is legitimately proved to be true that it's linked to something else. Don't claim that it is. I don't care how significant we think it might be never claim something. And some of the stuff I got today was just so bizarre that it, it angered me that, that, that I was getting that and I was getting it from the people I was getting it from. And some of those people, mm -hmm. I've been their pastors in the past. And, I, and it makes me mad at me because I, I obviously didn't do a very good job of teaching them to be skeptical of garbage. Yeah. So don't jump on the bandwagons present evidence, present it well, and stuff that we don't know how to argue, just do like I was saying I did with this guy in, in Garberville. I told him, I'm not a scientist. You're, you're a scientist. I'm not a scientist. Here's what the scientists are saying. But I don't think you can claim to argue you know something that nobody knows. So those are, those are decent arguments. They're fair arguments. Don't jump on the bandwagon unless the band's there. Yeah, and, and make sure that it's a good band. Amen. Sure. Yes, okay. All right, guys. Listen, I love y'all. Uh, I, I thank you that for plugging into these. Uh, all of you contributed mightily today, and it'll be valuable to all the others. I got a couple of guys in Africa. It's like way up in the wee hours of the morning there, so they, they are not in with us today, but they'll be looking in on your class and appreciating your questions and your comments. So thank you for all of them. There, they were excellent today. You did a great job. I'm really proud of all of you. I, I was telling somebody, I, I was telling somebody the other day that uh, after our last class, I could not have been more proud of the questions you asked, the contributions you made. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, uh, I tell you, Michael, you can tell Donald too. I was I was very. I, I told Pastor Tom this. I was very proud of his contributions last time. I'm looking forward to seeing what God's going to do with all of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
for those of you in Redway, I'll see you tomorrow. All right. All right, man. All right. God bless. God bless, God bless guys. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye, Mike. 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 Bye,